Tuning in from Facebook, YouTube, or viewing from BTBN.TV, we welcome you. My name is Carolyn Marshall, and this is where the manifested sons of God gather to hear from God. We are just so blessed for yet again another time where we can come and hear from our Father. Before we go forth inside of the rest of the service, let us go forth inside of prayer. Father, we thank you this evening. We give you praise this evening. We honor you. We say that you are glorious and worthy of all the praise. You see everyone that is counted and not gotten to tune in online on this evening. We ask God that you be with each household. You be with each one that's in need of salvation, of healing, of deliverance, and that you, God, will get this yourself the glory. May your word come forth and not return to you void. We thank you for each and every single time you give us our daily bread. We bless you, bless the minister and all those participating even on this evening in today's service. We thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Tell your friends that the MSOG Online Revival is happening right now. And before we go any further... We're going to go forth inside of praise and worship with new anointing. And we may even have a treat for you this evening, Portraits of the Word. So stay tuned because it's going to be awesome. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Behold, what man of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Come on. We are the sons of God. 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 We are victorious. We are victorious. We are the righteousness of our Lord. We are ambassadors.
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I am a son of God. Good evening and welcome to MSOG Revival. We want to thank God for that awesome portrait of the word. Amen. Such a, a, a wonderful uh, ministry in dance to the glory of God. So we thank God for, amen, the worship thus far and Tonight, we're going to continue in a lesson that we started on last week. And so we're going to be picking up right where we left off. And tonight's uh, uh, topic is restoring the image of God. Well, we are so thankful to have with us today our, our pastor, Marshall Cleveland, and amen, and so we're happy that you're with us, and uh, we're just so thankful also for all of you that are online with us tonight. God is good, and I hope that you are having a really blessed day. You know, the Lord is good in spite of all that is happening in the world. He is still good. So I wanna jump right into the word tonight because we don't want to be, uh, be uh, laboring the time. We want to get right into the scripture tonight and get your Bible and get your paper and pen and let's just walk through the Word of God. We're going to talk about something that is going to impact our lives, impact how we uh, operate, how we view, what our perspective, what our understanding ought to be in the Word of God. And you know, I've always been excited when I come to studying this passage of Scripture. It's been an ancient look like scripture in my uh, heart uh, for many, many years, and it's found in Romans chapter 8, and the verses are 28 and 29. So we're going to have our pastor read that scripture for us, and that will be our text for tonight, and then we're going to move forward into the teaching for this evening. Amen. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Praise the Lord. Now those two verses right there is going to give us the foundation and they are the foundation upon which we're going to go the gamut of the Bible. And so tonight I want us to see uh, something very deliberate about the Word of God. And that is uh, because, because uh, this is a verse that somehow escapes many of the sons of God. Many of the sons of God, many times we wonder how is it that all things work together for the good. And we are sometimes throw that uh, out there uh, but still not understand what it's saying to us and what the scripture is teaching regarding uh, this word. So tonight, by the leading of the Holy Ghost, I want to just continue to allow him to direct us in this truth. Now, Paul writes and he says, all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So I want us to see in verse 28 right off the top that there is a purpose that we need to understand. You know, there, there's a purpose that is spoken of in this word. And then in verse 29, it's talking about uh, that purpose uh, and, and in a more explanatory way. It's telling us in verse 29 is that we uh, are to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn 
among many brethren. So I want to talk about this because in, in the previous uh, lesson uh, before, we, we come across something and it was a question that we asked and we uh, answered that in the last lesson. But I want to really back up and pick up that again because sometimes we uh, look at uh, the creation and we see the all of Adam. So let's go back to Genesis chapter one and let's look at verse 26 for a moment because in Romans here, it tells us that, that God's purpose for us is to conform us to the image of his son. Well, let's look at what happened, what is stated in Romans in our Genesis one and 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So, so God, in the very beginning of creating mankind, when he, before he created man, God said, we want to, or we are going to create him in our image and in our likeness. And I know there's a lot of stuff that may be floating around about what is the image of God and all the likeness of God, but the scripture is still plain. And so I want us to stay with the Bible. The Bible tells us that God created us in his image and in his likeness. That was the very heart and mind of God, and that's exactly what he did. Now, I've oftentimes said and, and, and asked, how, what do we suppose was the great or the, uh, the worst effect of the fall of Adam? What was the worst effect of that fall? And many times the answer would come back that, 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 that you know, uh, he disobeyed God. And the answer would come back that he, uh, uh, by disobeying God, he plunged the whole human race into, into a depraved state. And, and by disobeying God, uh, the, the, the spirit of iniquity came in and, and, and began to rule and reign and death began to rule and reign over all of mankind. And so we will easily suppose that that is that uh, a very uh, thing that, that really was treacherous in its own right and was so, so uh, terrible. And yes, every sense of the word it was. But that's some, there's something else that I want to point to tonight. There's something else that I want to try to move us into God's mind and move us into God's thinking and, and, and cause us to see what God was looking at. You know, when God said, let us make man in our own image, I mean, he was he had to be proud of that. He had to be glad about that. You know, you know how children are, are taking on the image of their parents and the parents is proud of that. The parents is, is able to walk around and, and say, now, that's my child. You know, we have a young uh, man in the studio here and he has a little uh, a little uh, a baby boy. And that little baby boy takes on the image of his parents. Now, you know, he, he may get at me while because I didn't call his name, but that's all right. He know his name. If he doesn't know his name, then no, I don't know what to say. But that baby takes on the image. And, you know, sometimes parents walk around and somebody say, oh, he looks just like you. Well, they get kind of proud of that. They kind of, kind of you know, they could, oh, my God, he's looking like me. He looks like daddy. You know, he looks like mom, you know. And, and so that's something that the parent relishes in. Well, God now said before he made mankind. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So God had something in him that he wanted children and he wanted them to look like him. Oh, bless the Lord. 
He wanted sons and daughters to look like him. He wanted them to be like him. He wanted them to experience uh, him in fellowship and in communion. So he says, we're not going to make them like the animals. We're not going to make them like the reptiles. We're not going to make them like the birds of the air, but we're going to make them in our own image. Oh, bless his name. And so what's the worst thing to have? Because God had a plan way back in eternity. And, and so what's the worst effect of the fall of Adam is that it marred. It allowed sin to mar the image of God. So now when people look at mankind now, they don't know what they're looking at. They, you know, they see all different versions of what a child of God is, what a son of God is. They see this version over here, another version over there, another version somewhere else. But there is only one <laughs> version of a true son of God. Hallelujah, Jesus. And so that image has been tainted. That image has been spotted. That image has got a blemish on it. And see, and Satan said to them in the garden that God is really a liar. God really didn't tell you the truth. God didn't, didn't give it to you straight. And so now, ever since then, God has been wooing man to believe him and wooing man and trying to restore his image as he intended for it to be. Oh, bless you, God. Oh, bless you, God. You know, now I, I'm just hearing something in my spirit. And uh, I want us to go a little bit further because we're going to we're going to get into this. How does this image get restored? Man that has has caused at the fall the image of God. He's the only created being that God said I made him in my own image. He's the only one. And that image, Satan didn't want that. God intended to have sons of God populating the earth. How do you know that, Bishop Jones? Because he told them to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So he intended to have sons of God walking through and out throughout the entire world. But Satan now has has come in and, and, and marred that image plunged the human race into darkness, allowed death to rule and reign by the spirit of iniquity in mankind. And now when people look at men today, they don't know what they're looking at for the most part. And there's been years and years and years of all these different renditions of what a son of God looked like. Oh, bless you, Jesus. But God is not defeated. God is not defeated. So let's go to another uh, 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 point here that I really want us to uh, see, because when we look at this, as we look into our opening text, let's go back to verse 29 of Romans 8, because if you're going to understand Romans 8 and uh, Romans 8, 28, you've got to include verse 29. And I'll show you in a minute why. Let's go back and look at uh, that opening uh, Romans 8, 29. See the first word there that says for? That word is a connector. So go ahead and read that for us, uh, Pastor. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So if that word for is a connector, then it's connecting the previous verse. And so the previous verse tells us what? Romans 8, 28. What does that tell us? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So we see now that those two verses, because the word for immediately ties both of those verses together. 
Verse 28 ends with the word purpose. And verse 29 tells us what God's purpose is. Verse 28 ends with the word purpose. And verse 29 tells us what that purpose is. In other words, God's purpose is to conform us to the image of his son. That's what God is doing. That's, that's what he's doing right now in every son. In every life of the sons of God, his, his, his purpose is to conform us in such a way that when people look at us, when people entertain us, they are looking at the son of the living God that is looking identical to Jesus Christ as he was the son of God walking on this earth. So God has that same mind today. Thousands of years later, he moves through the Apostle Paul and he says through the Apostle Paul that my purpose is still in place. I desire to conform your life to the image of the son of the living God. That's his purpose. Now. The, the scripture says, for those that he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of the predestination tonight, but I am going to say this because it warrants it, and it must be, that if we are to understand predestination, if you are to understand predestination, there are some things that you've got to understand first. And there are four cornerstone uh, truths that you've got to understand if you're going to teach predestination or you're going to try to explain it to someone or you're going to try to understand it for yourself. What are those four things? The first thing to understand predestination is an absolute must. You've got to understand the foreknowledge of God. If we don't understand the foreknowledge of God, we will not make the right relationship to predestination. Uh, the next thing that we have to understand, we have to understand that uh, the sovereignty of God, God is sovereign in the entire universe. We have to understand that. What does it mean when we say God is sovereign? A lot of times we say, well, God is sovereign, so whatever is going to be, is going to be. You know, you, you hear that statement like that, you know, but that doesn't explain God's sovereignty. And that's not really uh, a good explanation for it because uh, God's sovereignty is, is talking to us about that God is the one that establishes the consequences for every deed that is done in the entire universe. That's what makes him sovereign. That he alone, there is no one else that can determine what the consequences are for the deeds and acts of men, angels, everything that's in that universe. See, that's why he's sovereign because he has already established the consequences for all deeds. Amen. He doesn't have to, and, and, and the reason I point us to this is because sometimes we think God is reactional. But God is not reactional like that. God has already established the sovereign law. And so therefore, when something takes place, God has already established what the consequence of that is. That's why the scripture says, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. That's a law that's been established. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's a law. When, we, when, when Adam disobeyed God, God didn't have to create the consequence. The consequence was already created. The consequence was already established. 
See, so God don't have to go and he's not reactionary like that. So that's what I want you to just see in subject. And I don't want to stay there because we will do something on that another time. But let's understand. You got to understand predestination. You got to understand uh, to understand predestination. You got to understand God's sovereignty. You got to understand the foreknowledge of God. And then you also have to understand what it is, what it means uh, to have the freedom of the human will. All four of those components is going to enable you to understand sovereignty. You know, because a lot of times people will say, uh, Pastor, that God, that, 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 that the human will doesn't really matter. But it does. It matters what you decide. It matters what your uh, decisions are. Predestination never take away your right to choose. See, you, it's, it's going to matter. So now let's go a little bit further. Because we want to now see that since Adam fell in the garden, the image of God has been marred. And so we want to talk about how Will that image be restored? And so let's look now at some things here. Because, uh, you know, the, let's look at a, a passage of scripture before we get there in 2 uh, Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. Let's, let's look at that for just a moment. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, so the scripture is saying to us that we have been given, or there has been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. And it is now by these promises that has been given to us that we might be partakers of the divine nature. In other words, when, when Adam uh, sinned, he, he was plunged into darkness and, 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 and there, was, there was nothing left but, but, but a blackness of sin when God looked at mankind. He did not see himself his own image. He saw where sin had darkened the, and, and stained the, the, the image of God. And so now God moved down through years and years and sending messages after messages to get us back to where we now can have the image of God restored. And that's what Paul is saying, that God didn't just, he doesn't just save us and then leave us somewhere in a corner. But God says, I want you to look just like my son. I want you to be just like my son. I want you to have the same character of my son. I want you to have the same speech as my son. I want you to have the same thoughts as my son. God says, I'm doing a, a work in you. And I'm doing a work through you, but I need to conform. I need to make you, amen, a representation that looks and acts just like the son of the living God, Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came on the scene, you know, when Jesus came on the scene, some things happened. Because when Jesus came, he was able to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what he was saying is that now I'm coming and I'm the representation of the kingdom. You know, and, and, and so when, when you and I as, I, as we go into this on the image being restored, we can only have an opportunity to have that image restored we can only have that opportunity when we experience the new birth. When we experience the new birth, we are born 
of the Spirit of God, born by the Spirit of God. We've been made anew. We've been created anew. So what are we talking about when we say uh, restoring the image? Well, we know a lot of sons of God doesn't look like sons of God. We know a lot of people been saved uh, in the church preaching, but don't look like Jesus. When people look at us in the marketplace, we know that people don't look like Jesus. When people listen to our conversation, we can know that people may come to a conclusion that we don't even sound like Jesus. You know, so God is working, saying, look, I want to conform you so that when people see you and me, when they hear you and me, when they entertain us, they'll be able to say, we have entertained a son of the living God. So we have to now, we have to understand that at the new birth, there's some things happen. What happens? Jesus comes and takes up residence in the son. Jesus comes and he lives in the son. And so in receiving him, as Peter was telling us in, in this second Peter, at, in receiving Christ, we now receive the same nature. We receive the same nature. And, 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 and that's all taking place at, at the new birth. There is no one born again and don't have the nature of God. See, and there is no one born again and later on they have to get the Holy Ghost. That those are erroneous teachings because we are born of God. We're born by the Spirit of God. And so we are now the new birth is a spiritual birth. And so therefore, God is spirit. And those that worship him, he says, must worship him in spirit and truth. So if God is spirit, let's find that scripture. I think it's in John chapter four, somewhere there, St. John. God is a spirit because if God is a spirit, See, John 4, 24. Go ahead and read that. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, this scripture is saying something to us because it's saying, telling us what, who God is. God is a spirit. So, so if we are sons of God, then we too have to be spirit. See, we have to be spirit. So that's the new birth. And then it, only, it, it not only tells us that part, but this scripture also says that those that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I'm going to just throw a sidebar here that every time we are singing and shouting don't mean we're worshiping. Look at what God is saying. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth truth. And so we must, God is saying to us, actually, we're to continue to flow and live and operate from the position of the spirit in all things. And so because we have been born again, we are now the sons of God. But that, that, doesn't, that doesn't rule out that so many times people don't look like sons of God. I know that if you looked at, it's, it, perhaps if you looked at my life at some point, you'd have said, well, he doesn't look like a child of God, you know? Uh, but that's what God is concerned about because we must allow ourselves to be conformed to the image of God. We must allow that. And we're gonna talk about how we're gonna do that. Now, because we are born again, and I want to say this as well, because we are born again and we receive the nature of our father, we can now walk in the divine character. You and I can walk in that divine character. We couldn't do that before we got saved. 
Before we got saved, we was under the captivity of the enemy and sin ruled and reigned over our lives. But now that we are sons of God, born again by the spirit of God, we can walk in that divine nature. We don't have to do anything outside of that divine nature. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Oh, bless you, God. The new birth, in the new birth, we become sons and are now able to live godly in this present world. Now, I want us to see something. Let's go to Titus chapter 2 and verses 11 and 12. Let's go there for a moment because sometimes when we get saved and you get around, uh, you, you know, people and you start putting your trust and in people and you see the way individuals, people live, you are sometime gravitate to that. But let's look what the word of God says about the salvation. Let's read verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So God says, I want you to live, and not only do I want you to live that, that's what he wanted from Adam, to live a, a soberly righteous and godly life. You see the parallels? He wanted Adam to do the same thing. That's why he said the day that you, uh, you know, eat from that tree, you're going to die. You know, you're not going to have the ability to do what I've instructed you to do and commanded you to do. So he says the grace now, the grace of God, that bring us salvation. This grace has appeared unto all men, and it teaches. I want you to see this. Grace is not a weak, watered down gospel. Grace is the power of God in the heart and life of every son of God that enables the Son of God to live how? To live soberly. To live how? To live righteously. To live how? To live godly. Where do we live that way at? In this present world. We don't wait on the, the hereafter. We're not going to need it then. And we, if we don't live it here, we're not going to have a good hereafter. So we must realize that those that say that they are influenced by the grace of God are saying that grace teach me to deny ungodliness. Grace teaches me to deny worldly lust. Grace teaches me. See, the, the grace of God will cause me, if I'm walking in submission to the uh, Spirit, will cause me to do everything that the Holy Ghost lead me to do and not do anything that the enemy tempts me to do. That's the power of the grace of God. And so we see here that when people see a man or woman walking in the grace of God, walking by this, the spirit of God, then whenever they see that individual, they are seeing the manifestation of the son of the living God. So Jesus said something like to Philip one day, he said, you know, he that has seen me has seen the father. That's the testimony that we as sons of God have to bear. And, and to do that, God says, I've got to restore. I've got to restore this image. And, and, and it's not something that we got to have a, a doctor degree to understand. God's got it laid out clearly in the word. So we're going, to, we're going to move a little bit further and see what the scripture is going to say to us as we go on into the lesson tonight. Because we know that we were made in the image of God. We know that that image was marred with sin. We know that Jesus came to redeem us from the curse. 
And we know that he came to, 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 to not just redeem us from the, the, that curse, but to restore the express image of the Son of God. We know that he came to do that. Now, I want you to see something. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. And I want us to see uh, something in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the 43rd verse. We're going to look at something because we saw the uh, writing in Genesis about the first Adam. And so we're going to start reading there and we're going to read on down. 1 Corinthians 15, 43? Yes, go, we can start there. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. And it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now I want us to pause right there. Notice what this word says. It is written, the first man, Adam. Okay, so we have the first man that was back in the garden. And that's, that's something no one argues with. So that's our first man. That was the first man. But notice what it says. He said that uh, that man was made a living soul. And what that tells us that he was earthy. That first man was of the earth. But then notice the same verse continues with saying the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So now we're looking at the first man, which was Adam in the garden. The last Adam, and it was interesting that God chose these words to name him Adam. The first man, Adam, the last man, Adam. And, and I wanted you to see something very deliberately in this text because God only recognizes two men in the earth. That's why he said, called the first man in Genesis 1, the first man, Adam. And that's why he calls Jesus the last man, Adam. But notice he goes on to say something else because he didn't only say that Adam uh, was the first and the last uh, man, Adam, was uh, a quickening spirit. Let's read a little bit further uh, in next two verses here. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. So it's just telling us here that the natural came in the garden, that was Adam. And then it's telling us afterward came the Lord from heaven, the spiritual. So, so now we all have had a natural birth. We, not we all agree with that. See, now that we've all had a natural birth, God sent the word saying we must be born again. That new birth is a spiritual birth. So if you haven't had the second birth, you're on a pathway to eternal damnation. See, you, there's no other options for you on that path because God has, has, has stopped recognizing that Adam as his son. Now let's just look at this a little bit further. Let's look at verse 47. The first man is of the earth. The earthy. first, the first man is of the earth, earthy. That means that, and our Apostle Banks did a, a just a masterful teaching on this many years ago, when she just kind of explained because a lot of people uh, was getting stuck with the uh, the the breath that was uh, blew into Adam's nostril, and so many of the teachings have identified that as the spirit of God. 
and see that is where we and we can, I can see how, how people come there, but that just wasn't the truth. And when Apostle went through that uh, uh, lesson, it was just a masterful job to that reveal that no, that was when, because everything about this first man was earthy, and that's why the Apostle Paul now could have the revelation because he wasn't there when God created Adam, but he got this revelation by way of the spirit that the first man was of the earth and he was earthy. Now, what does it say further? The second man is the Lord from heaven. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So now I want you to go back to verse uh, 45. Let's go back to verse 45. And saints, we're just going to take a few more minutes and, and, you know, let the, when the Lord say just cut off, we're just going to cut off. So we just want to follow that lead. Look at verse 45, read. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So we see the first man in verse 45 was first Adam, a living soul. We see the last Adam, a quickening spirit. But now in verse 47, see in verse 45, you got the first and the last. But look at verse 47. <coughs> verse 47, you have the first and the second. See? See, look at the same text. You have the first and the last, and you have the first and the second. So what the, the understanding is that Adam was the first man. And God didn't reckon, everybody that came on the planet was recognized in Adam. There was no recognition of a second man until Jesus Christ came. See, Jesus is the second man, and he is the one that is the Lord from heaven. So every one of us, every one of us in the earth today, we are either in the first Adam or we are in the last Adam. Now, if you're in the first Adam, you still got eternal damnation over you. But if you're in the last Adam, you have an opportunity, glory to God, to have everlasting life. That ought to cause you to be happy. I said you have an opportunity. I'm not saying you're guaranteed to have it, glory to God. But you got an opportunity to have eternal life, everlasting life. You've got that opportunity but if you're not born again, you don't even have the opportunity. The new birth is not the end of the sons of God. The new birth is the beginning of a son of God. And so that's where the walk in God begins at the new birth. But sometimes we get saved and then we, we say, well, I done made it in. I got fire insurance. I done escaped hell. Not so sure. Not so sure because the scripture that I studied tells me he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. So we get saved. I want us to see this. We get saved through the, by the way of the new birth. And that puts us in the last Adam. Oh, bless you, God. That puts us in the family of God. That puts us in the kingdom of God. And we now are no longer of this world. See, that, then I, just think about that. The scripture says we are in the world. Let's, let's try to find that. I'm, I'm going to quote scriptures, but, but I, 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 I know we got to have it in documentation. So the, script, there's a, there's the word of God said we're in the world, but we are not of the world. Now, since when did we not become or not be of the world. See, since when did that take place? That could only take place by way of one dying from this world and being born again in a whole new world, a whole new kingdom, a whole new race. 
That can only take place. And, and so let me just uh, scroll over here and try to pull that up because, you know, we need to always have that scripture. And, uh, you know, sometimes we get to get to going and we can just we just start quoting scriptures. But, you know, we have to slow down some and make sure that we find it. The scripture that I'm looking for says you are in the world, but not of the world. Amen. And it's in one of the epistles of John. And so we're going to make our trip over there to find it. Bless God. Because it's so important because the, the scripture says that the first man, Adam, is earthy. But the last man or the second man is the Lord from heaven. And so if Adam was the first and Jesus is the second man that tells you that every body is either identified in the first man, Adam, or in the second man, Adam. That's what that tells you. Everybody. Uh, now, let's look at this. But that's, let's go back. Let's kind of look at the scripture that we're looking for is you're in the world, but not of the world. And we want to make sure that somebody find that, put it up on the, uh, uh, there it is, uh, St. John 17, 16. Let's go ahead and read that. They are not of the world. Even who, are, who are the they that he's talking about there? See, that's, that's the point. Who, who are the they he's talking about? Let's back up and read verse 16 then. Let's, uh, verse 15. And that may give us a little bit more uh, context here. Okay, there you go. This is Jesus in, in his prayer yes. about the sons of God or the people of God or those that's going to believe on him. This is Jesus praying as he, is, as he himself is about to leave and go back to glory. What does he say? I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from the evil. I don't pray that you take them out of the world, see, but I'm praying that you keep them from the evil. This is the heart of God. Now, just look, at, look deep into that verse for just a moment and see the heart of Jesus. He ain't running around trying to make evil happen to you, trying to make evil happen to me. He doesn't have that kind of heart. Jesus is praying, Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Jesus identified that there was evil in the world, and he's identifying that we were evil in the world and he's identifying that that there is a necessity to pray and to intercede and, to, and, and on the behalf of those that is in the world but look what he says now in verse 16 they are not of the world they are not they are not of the world the thing pastor marshall the thing that is that is uh tripping up so many of the sons of god it's because they are keeping their hands tied to the world. The world's ambitions, the world's materialism, the world's uh, image, the world's uh, way of operating. Uh, there are so many sons of God that is keeping ties with the world. But Jesus says, they are not, glory to God, they are not of the world. Now, you know, he can't say it no plainer than that. But look what he says. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. They are not of the world, even as I. In other words, he's making this, 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 this uh, uh, analogy here or comparison here. He said, they're just like me. Yeah. That's what he's saying, y'all. He said, they're just like me. They're not of the world, even just as I am not of the world. See, you can't serve God, Lord help us, if you're going to hold on to the world. You can't fulfill the purpose of God. You can't, 
You can't see, see the world. The, let's let's just look at that because, because this is the thing that is tripping up many sons. Let's go to another scripture. First John chapter two, verses 15, 16 and 17. Let's go there and see what the scripture tells us, because we must always let scripture talk behind scripture. Let's see what that says, because he said we are not of the world. Huh? We're not of the world. We are not of the world just like he is not of the world. Remember when Jesus was standing before Pilate? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Yes. You know, he, we, we, I, we're not of this world. I came down from heaven. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Let's look at what it says here. Read. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now you see that? Do you see that? Now, now, now we don't have to make that say nothing. <laughs> That's an elementary statement there. He's saying, don't love the world. Don't love the things in the world. And he says, if any man love the world, then the love of the Father, hebakosa, is not in in him. You know, I, I, I can't make that up. I can't I can't see how anyone can look at this and 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 God don't let the enemy blind you. Don't let the enemy seduce you to thinking that that don't mean what it says. That means exactly what it says. It's telling me, Jerome, if you love the world, then the love of the father don't abide in you. That's what it's telling me. And the devil don't want me to believe that word because he want to keep that stain on the image of God. And he wants to keep me walking around with blemishes and stains so that God now will be able to be looking at me and not seeing his unadulterated son of God in his express image. The devil is, is on a war path. And he doesn't want you to believe this word. But the word is so straightforward. If any man, it doesn't matter whether you're black, doesn't matter whether you're white, doesn't matter whether you're in Asia, doesn't matter whether you're in China, doesn't matter whether you're from the low life of the streets or the excellence of, uh, uh, of celebrity status. It doesn't matter. He says, if any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. Now that's just, a, and then he put a, is that a period behind that? <laughs> yeah. He put a period behind that. He said, that's it. There's no debate about it. There's no question about it. That, that's just plain. That's why Jesus would say something like this. If a man come after me, he must deny himself. He must forsake all. And come after me. That's why the apostle said, I counted all but dung, all my accomplishments, all the stuff, because there was something that stained my image, no matter how good I was, called sin, called iniquity, marred the image of God. That's why God is not, he's not, he's not uh, sitting there cheering my, my accomplishments in the world. Uh, cheering my uh, successes that I have in, 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 in how much we have gained in possessions. God is after restoring his image right here on earth. Glory to God. Right here now. Glory to God. Let's read the next verse right there. For all that is in the world. How much is in the world? All Not, that is no, in the world. No, all that is in the world. See how God talks like this? See, God doesn't have to, he doesn't mix words. He makes it very clear for all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. And the lust of the eyes. Now, Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 said we have, ex chapter 2, 1 and 4 said we have escaped the corruption through lust. He's talking about John is talking about that's what's in the world. See, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. Mm -hmm. And the pride of life. Yes. Is not of the father, but is of the world. See how, see how clear God makes his word? 
See, you, you don't need somebody to just try to explain all this. Well, God done told you, said, that's not of me. He's just saying point blank, that's not of me. So wherever you see that, you can be sure and say with confidence, that's not God. You know, wherever I see the operation of the lust of the flesh, I can be confident in saying that's not God. Wherever I see the lust of the eyes, people just, oh, they see this and they want that. They want more. They want this and want that. That's not God. Wherever you see the pride of life, that pride of life is a subtle thing. It causes you to undermine dignitaries, undermine friends, undermine relationships. It causes you to, to have a secret agenda. That pride of get, that, and that pride of life that can't stand for somebody else to succeed, can't stand for somebody else to, to have the, the spotlight, or can't stand for somebody else to get some uh, praise. Uh, that's the pride of life. If it, nobody's heaping praises on that person, that person is not all right. Oh, Jesus. But you know, God came right back and said, it's not of the Father, but is of the world. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Now look what he's going to tell us what's going to happen. Read, read the next verse. The world pass away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So the world pass away and the lust of the world pass away too, but... He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. When we are sons of God, we have the opportunity to abide forever here. We have that opportunity. But if we get tied up and tangled up with the affairs of this life, if, we get ha if the appetite that we have is for worldliness and we practice the way of the world, we will get the same judgment that is coming to the world. We've got to tell men and women, it's time to get out of here. It's time to be ready. It's time to get out of that first Adam and get in this last Adam and then work out your soul salvation in trembling and in fear. There is no time to look to the left and look to the right. There is no time to be concerned about what somebody else is doing. There is no time to be fussing and arguing about who's right in this church and who's right in that church and what this minister did and what that minister did. It's time to work out your soul salvation in trembling and in fear. Heard Apostle Banks said we got to give place to wrath. My God, we got to get, we can't get out. See, if we don't give place to wrath, what God was saying that if you don't give place to wrath, you'll get caught up in the wrath. Yeah. Oh, bless you. I don't have, I don't have time for it. I don't have time for, time is short. I don't know how you feel in your spirit, but time is short. You know, uh, Helen Miller sing, sing, sings a song, Time is Winding Up. Boy, that's, that's, that's close now. Time is winding up. So we've got to get out of the first Adam and get anchored in the second Adam and be steadfast, be unmovable, be always abounded in the works of the Lord. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Let's, let's see, can we go a little bit further here? Don't need to. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Father. So, so, so now we see this. We see that we are not to love the world. We see that Jesus said we are not, they are not of the world, just like he is not of the world. Now, you know what, what I, I saw just then, that something in my spirit Jesus was able to walk on this earth as a son of God without sin because he was not of the world and he chose to walk in obedience to his father. Now he was able to do that. 
in the midst of all the world, in the midst of all the temptation, in the midst of all the suffering, in the midst of all the rejection, in the midst of all manner of evil being done to him, he was able to walk without any guile in his mouth. Oh, bless your father. Can you imagine having Judas right there in your camp? Having him right there in your camp, in your bosom, so to speak, working in the same bishopric. Can you imagine? And he never utters a word. Oh, Jesus, help me be like that. Help me, God, help me be like that. He never uttered a word. He just kept on going, just kept on going. Kept on serving. And he didn't utter a word in such a way that when, when it came time for him to betray him, folks sitting around at the dinner table had to ask a question. Lord, is it I? Oh, Jesus. They was working with a Judas. He was going in and out with them in ministry. And they had to ask, Lord, am I the one? Because they didn't know who was the one. But Jesus knew all along. Oh, bless your father. Oh, bless your father. You ought to give God a praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, bless you, father. Now, I want us to look at just a little bit more here. You know, I was, uh, let me just say this, because when I was in the, one of the conferences, um, maybe 25, 30 years ago, Dr. Banks ministered from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, about the first man and the second man. And that's really where it really unfolded, where it just kind of unfolded where you can see where you can see more clearly these two races. God created a whole new race that was not of this world because he told us that the first Adam was earthy, he was of the world. But the second was the Lord from heaven. And so the scripture in Romans 8, 29 said that he wants to conform us to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God is not satisfied with Jesus being the only one. God is not satisfied with this Jesus. And this is what a lot of the church world hang their hat on, where Jesus paid it all. Yes, he paid it all, but he paid it all so that you could have an opportunity. Oh, glory to God. To have the image of God restored. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Oh, bless you, Jesus. There ought to be some, there ought to be a change in your behavior now, a change in your life, a change in the way you talk, a change in the way you're walking among men and women, a change in your appetite. You ought to have a burning passion to please God because you got the nature of God. And for you and I, to sin, for you and I to go and do wrong, we have to oppose our own nature. Glory to God, glory to God. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. So now I want us to see this because we're talking about how this, how is God going to do this? How is God going to do this? And I have just a little bit of time here. But I want to get this syllabus in. How is God, Hebakasa, how is God going to restore his image? Let's look at something here. Let's look at something because every event, and I just want to say this, every event of our lives can be contributed to God's great purpose for our life. Molding us into the likeness of Christ. Every event, you know, that's why the scripture started out saying all things. I know we don't think, want to think it's all, but God said all things 
work together. Let's go back and read it. Uh, Romans 8, 28, because that's the cornerstone verse. He says, all, not some, but all things work together for good. Is that it? Don't, go ahead and read. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So all things, everything that happens in the life of a son of God who loves God, that's a key hinge right there, who loves God. See, God didn't say something without qualifying it. He said, this is for those that love me. See, because everybody don't love him. Oh, bless you, Jesus. But he said, for everyone that loves me, there is nothing that will come into their life that will not, that I will not work it for their good. Oh, bless you, Father. That's what he's telling us here. He's saying that's what, so every event for the son that loved God. So I, when I first read this scripture, when I first uh, learned this scripture, I immediately saw something. I immediately saw something. I saw this like a, like, like a boat of lightning just blowing up. And what it, what it was, when I read Romans 8, 28, I immediately saw that my responsibility in the whole matter was simple. It wasn't a hard thing. I didn't have to worry about it. I didn't have to try to think about, oh my God, how is I'm gonna do that? I didn't have to worry about, you know, all oh, these things that's gonna come on my life. I'm gonna be toiling with them. I didn't have to do all that. I, I immediately saw what was my responsibility. And my responsibility was to love God. I immediately saw no one was around me. No one was saying nothing. But I said, now, wait a minute now. If I just love God, then I don't have to worry about what's going on. I don't have to worry about what's happening over here. I don't have to worry about what's happening over there. See, because those things that are happening, if I love God, are things that are working, that God's allowing He's allowing some and he's sending some that they might work out for or in the behalf of my good. See, that's what God does. Now, let's look at, look, look, look at another point here. Because we talked about God wanting us to look like Jesus. God wants us to talk like Jesus. He wants us to act as Jesus. What does that mean? It means God wants children that walks in his character. God wants children that walks in his character. Not somebody just do what I'm doing here. No, 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 no. Not somebody just can preach well. Not somebody that just can break down the scripture. You know, sometimes I think about, I said, God, you've given us a lot of under, uh, uh, a word in the, in the revivals, a lot of word in the reformation, a lot of word, and we know, we know, we know, but what God is saying, what are you doing? Because your responsibility is just to love God. See, the Bible said, for the love of Christ constrains us in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 14. That means it puts some brakes on you. Glory to God. That means it, it, it constrains you from doing certain things. When you, somebody got an alt in, 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 uh, done, done you some ill, you, the love of God will constrain your tongue. The love of God will constrain your thoughts. The love of God will constrain you from any ills. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Now, I know something about that. I know something about that. And I'm sure many of you do as well. 
Amen. There's some things that I just don't say because they're not needed to be said. There's some things that I have experienced that I will not just lay at the foot of the person by whom I experienced them with. And I'm trying to tell us this thing because it's not good enough. She got, they got the scripture right there. This is a powerful verse right here. And we're going to read it in just a moment. It's not, that's not good enough for us to just to know the word and read how Stephen was laying there uh, bleeding to death and being stoned by people while he was preaching the gospel. And yet he says, I lay not. Say, Father, don't lay this sin to their charge. They're killing him. They're killing him. People ain't not killing me. They're not killing us. Oh, Jesus. The love of Christ constrains you. The Bible said, blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Let's read the scripture on the board. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Then we're all dead. Mm -hmm. if one died for all, all dead. The love of Christ constraineth us. That constraineth is in the continual operation. Hallelujah. It's not a one up. That constraineth us is a continual operation. Means that if you run into a situation today, the love will constrain you. If you're walking in love now, because remember, God done said, those that love him, all things are working out for the good. So if, the, if you run into a situation two days later, the love of God constrains. So my responsibility is to walk in love toward God. And if I, I want to I really say this by the unction of the Holy Ghost. Because here about God, hey God, you cannot walk in a loving relationship with God and not walk in a loving relationship with your brothers. You cannot do that. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, they love God, but the scriptures, how can you love God, which you've never seen, and not love your brother who you see every day? Now, you know, we ought to put that scripture up. That's a good one right there too. Because a lot of times people say, well, I love God, but I can't stand him. I love God, but you don't show that love toward all people. The Bible is so deliberately clear. God said, you can't love me. you never seen me. You know, look, look what the scripture say right there. First John 4 and 20, read. If a man say, I love God. If, if, if a man say that they love God. Huh? And hated his brother. And hated his brother. He is a liar. Now, you know how God talked. God said he's just a liar. He's just lying. It may be a smooth lie. It may sound good. He may add a lot of stuff to justify how, why he feels that way about that individual. But the scripture goes right to the, through the chase and say he's just a liar. You know why he says that? Because, Pastor, everything that I did unto God, he forgave me. Oh, Jesus. Hear God. If, hallelujah, Jesus. Everything that I did, and I've done some nasty things, everything I did, God forgave me. You think that those people that stuck spears in Jesus' side in the front of his own mother, in front of his own siblings, but he said with his dying breath, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. They wasn't even saved. But that's the compassion. That's the compassion he had for them. That's why Romans 8 said those that love him. Because when you love him, his love constrains you. Ah, Jesus. God's trying to restore, restore, restore Christ's likeness back on the earth. 
Restore the image of God that's been marred. Hate for hate, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, slap for slap, hit for hit. Restore peace. Restore love. Restore the image of God. God is love. Oh, Jesus. Okay. I better settle down here. That's why I sat down tonight. Just to sit down. Because this word is too important. Now, we're going to finish up right here. Romans 8, 28. But let's read that scripture on their board first. If a man say what? If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. Mm -hmm. But he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? How? See how, how you, know, you know, God already know the answer. So he's not asking that question for himself. He's saying, Jones, how dare you say you love me? And you ain't never seen me. But you can't love Marshall. Or you can't love your brother. You can't love this one. You can't. And you told me that you pleaded with me to forgive you. And you don't want me mentioning what you've done. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. So how you tell me that you love me and you can't love your brother? He's, God said, no, Jerome, you're just a liar. You just, you know, God don't, he doesn't respect nobody's person now. He, you know, he just says so. He says, you can't do that. See? Now, let's go on to another passage and finish up. In Romans 8, 28, and I want to, this is the summary right here. I don't have the time to teach it, but I want to put it in the lesson for the sake of those of you that will further study. Let's look at Romans 8.28 again and read it for us, Pastor. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, I want to point some, some different points out here. First of all, I want to say that Romans 8.28 does not say that all things are good. It doesn't say that. And you would be in trouble trying to say that all things are good. There's some bad things that happens to people, to sons of God. All things are not good. That's not what the scripture teaches. In this life, Christian life, we experience good and bad, victory and defeat. That's what we experience. Now, now, let me point something out. I'm not talking about defeat in the sense that we get swallowed up in sin. and I'm not even talking about that aspect. I'm saying that the, what, the, what the scripture is teaching is that in our life, there's going to be an experience of good and bad things. That's just going to be. And now if you living on this planet, you tell me whether or not that's been the case in your own life. And I think we all know the answer to that. Another thing we're going to experience is prosperity and loss. Praises and criticism. And what I see a lot of times is good when we're getting praise. You know, people praise you. Oh, hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody praise me. I was thinking about something just the other day, and I, I, I had to examine. Hey, Lord, help me. I had to examine me. 
<laughs> I'm sitting there looking at something and watching, watching, uh, doing some work. I'm working. And I heard somebody say, Bishop Jones did this and did that. And I just stopped and listened. I said, they sure enough was watching. <laughs> but I had to examine and say, wait a minute now. You know, you, you get praise, but you're going to get some criticism too. So you have to be good with it because you trust who? Not the people that's talking. You're trusting God. Your father done told you. That's why Paul said, and we know. I got to finish here. So, so, so far, you're going to have some good and some bad victories and defeat, prosperity and loss, praises and criticism. And then you're going to have some successes and failures, promotions and demotions. Nobody likes that. Health and sickness. Nobody likes that. But that's what life is. We're going to experience that on this side of glory. Oh, bless you, God. Why? Because every event of life may be considered either good or bad. And God doesn't say it. God set the rule in eternity saying those that love me I'm keeping watch over them. Lord, I love you. Ah, Jesus. Ah, Jesus. I feel like just shouting. Because I've had to have God to watch over me. I don't even belong here. I should have been shot and dead long ago. But God watched over me because he had some foreknowledge that that thing that was that he saw in my heart was coming to fruition. Ah, oh, Jesus. So when the enemy says, I'm going to kill him, God said, no, you're not. When the enemy said, I'm going to shoot him, the enemy, God said, no, you're not. When the enemy said that he will not obey, God said, yes, he will. Because he already knew the end from the beginning. I've had some, some successes. I've had some failures. I've been had promotions. I've had demotions. I've had some good health. Thank God I've had good health. I, I don't know what the hospital looked like for me to be in the hospital bed. But, you know, that doesn't say that it can't happen tomorrow. Because this life, oh, bless you, God. All things, but what God is saying now, those things are working to the believer, to them that love God. God is using a combination of all those things, good and bad, to bring about his great purpose in the life of the Son. And it is through those things that that life is conformed to the image of the Son. And so in my final remarks, I'm a cook and a baker. I cook meats and veggies. I bake cakes and pies and donuts and bread and Danish. You know, I, I just go in there and start baking. But when I get ready to bake something, I have to inspect What's in the kitchen? Hey, God, Jesus, Jesus, because I already know the ingredients that I need to go into the thing that I'm going to bake. Oh, bless your father. Now, somebody else may be in the house, don't know the ingredients I need to make that item. But I know what I need. I know the different Ingredients, and I know the proportion that I need to put in the pot. I'm a cook. Oh, bless you, God. So when I go in there to bake a cake, I go in there with a thought, I'm finna bake a delicious cake. 
I don't go in there thinking I'm going to bake a cake that I don't even want to eat. I don't go in there thinking that I'm going to bake a cake that when I set it on the table, people are going to leave it sitting there because they don't want to, they don't even want it. They, they take a little snippet of it and leave it there. I don't go in there to cook like that because the object of me cooking is so that those that will eat it will be pleased. Oh, God help us. So I go to the store and get the ingredients that I need. Mm hmm. Now, some ingredients in themselves have a good taste, don't they? I mean, you, you know, sugar tastes sweet. Milk tastes all right. But there are some ingredients that taste bad. Hmm? No one enjoys eating baking powder. No one enjoys sitting down and getting a bowl of flour, eating flour. Hmm? No one enjoys that. But when a skillful cook combines all the elements, the good tasting ones, bad tasting ones, in the right proportions and places that cake in the oven with the right temperature, because God done said, I will not Put no more on you than you're able to bear. I got just the right amount of trials, just the right amount of persecution, just the right amount. All of it's working to conform you to the image of the Son of God. And then he says at the end, when that cake comes out of the oven, that cake is a credit to the cook that made it. And it's a pleasure to all that ate it. That's what God says. I want to make you into the image of the Son. Oh, bless his name. I want to restore that image so you'll be a delightsome. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So we could say, about that cake, all things were mixed together for the good pleasure of the will of the cook. Child of God, everything in your life, if you just love God, just love him, it's working out for your good. God bless you. We're going to stop right there. We love you tonight. We bless God for you. I hope you've got something tonight to just, that will stick to you because God is calling on the sons to manifest godly character and holiness every day of our lives. So we're going to leave you with that and I want to pray with you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for those that are in the audience. And we ask you, Lord God, to continue to minister to their heart. I just sense you moving in the land. I sense you stirring hearts all throughout the revival audience. So, Father, we give you glory. We give you honor and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Well, God bless you. We're going to ask you to co continue to pray for us, pray for our leader. Apostle Banks, amen, is working and uh, just working, you know, working continuously. And so I want you to keep her and Apostle Mike and Apostle Kareem, keep lifting them up in prayer as well as all the team. Uh, that's been here and that is working uh, this uh, ministry and throughout the entire Reformation. Let's pray for one another in Jesus' name. Let's worship in our giving, and you can see uh, 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 marybates.net uh, forward slash give, 
you can go there and give. Saints, let's continue to support the work of God. You know, we want to say thank you for your support. You've, you've been with us a long time, and we thank God for you, and we want you to continue to stand with us with your offering of support. That's at marybanks.net forward slash give, or your cash app, you can do it at uh, dollar sign MB Global Church. And you can also give at inside of the global church. If you don't have a church home, stop by the global church and, and, and take a look at what we have available for you. We thank God for all of you today, and we hope that you've been blessed in the Lord. Well, Pastor Marshall, it's time for us to go. We have Pastor Marshall here tonight, amen, been blessing us with their uh, presence and reading the scriptures. And so we want to say to you again, I'm Jerome Jones said, if you go with God, I know that God will surely go with you. And until the very next time, you do now by all means, have yourself a Jesus-filled day. Wow, what an awesome time our God has done it again. He has brought us another word that we can hold fast to. We pray that you were encouraged today. We pray that you felt the excitement and the love of God this evening through his word. Go forth inside of it. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in him is not in vain. Our God has ordained this time for you to hear him. And so, as we depart from this time, we invite you to join us again. Come back tomorrow for our Bible study at 11 Central Standard Time or 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our God is faithful and he's good. And we trust that you will encourage today. We'll see you next time.
not a static.